Ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, some students, welcome back to Georgetown for many of you. Now, for some of you, this uh, will have been unproblematic. You found your way here easily. For others, for whom it's perhaps the first time or it's been a little while, you might have had some difficulty getting to the building itself. Nevertheless, you've all arrived. Many thanks, and uh, you did the right thing. I'm particularly uh, pleased to be able to introduce tonight's event, not only because uh, uh, Dr. Annie Montigny hasn't been uh, to Georgetown before, and because the subject is one that is of interest to me personally and to many of us here, but because I think it's also an example of the kind of synergies that Education City allows us to benefit from. After all, it's a joint event with UCL Qatar. Um, UCL, of course, deals with archaeology um, and, and particularly regional uh, archaeology and material culture. And again, there is a, a, a fair, in, for some of the, those of us working at Georgetown, a natural overlap with those interests. But apart from anything else, UCL and Georgetown share this wonderful building. So uh, Dean Thilo Heeren is here uh, with, with us, or I should say director in the case of UCL. UCL is the only British university represented uh, in Education City. Um, and with that, I, I'm going to hand over to, for the introduction to Dr. Annie Montigny to one of UCL's foremost scholars, Dr. Rob Carter, who for some of you may know has produced possibly the most beautiful and most interesting book on pearling in the region. Uh, it's called Sea of Pearls. If you can get your hands on it, do. Um, he is a senior lecturer in archaeology specializing on the Middle East and has got a long, uh, a long career uh, writing and, and doing hands-on field work uh, on these kinds of questions in the region, in Qatar and the region. So I will hand over to him directly to introduce Dr. Montigny. Thank you, Jeff. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my very great pleasure, pleasure to introduce Dr. Annie Montigny, uh, who is probably one of the most distinguished and longest-serving experts of cultural heritage in Qatar uh, and uh, the anthropology of the people of Qatar, uh, having first come here as long ago as 1976. So that's a very long and distinguished career. Um, of course, the country has changed an enormous amount in those times, uh, but the people have remained uh, here and they have endured and they have adapted and changed uh, as their country has changed with them. Um, very few people have been able to see, uh, uh, very few outsiders have been able to see this um, from the 1970s onwards. Um, when Dr. Montigny first came here, she studied, came to study with a French archaeological team uh, and was coming to investigate the environment, but soon she got involved uh, in a more anthropological side um, and wrote her PhD on the Al Naimi tribe. Um, and uh, again, is probably the world's leading uh, Western expert um, on the lives of the Naim um, before the modern era and during the transition to the modern era. Um, while uh, working with the French team, she actually uh, was instrumental, in fact, basically set up a museum at Al Khor. Uh, this would be the start of a very long involvement with the museums of Qatar. And again, very few people have seen the development of the museum from the early stages of museum building through to the present day. And again, many things have changed over that time, and she has borne witness to this. Um, these days, uh, she works at the National Natural History Museum in Paris, but is still involved with the National Museum here in Doha, the National Museum of Qatar, where she has provided consultancy on the material culture and the anthropology and the ethnography and the oral history of the people of Qatar, uh, and is really informing uh, with the Qatari people the way that the museum will display the cultural heritage of this country. Uh, so we're very honored uh, to have uh, Dr. Montigny here um, I'm very much looking forward to her talk, uh, and I'm sure um, it'll give us some very great insights into the way that the museums have changed and what they're coming to today. So please, uh, can we welcome Dr. Montigny. I know you were, Rob. <laughs> okay. Good evening.
So tonight, I'm going to speak about something quite sensitive, in a way, because it concerns the identity question. First image, maybe you will be surprised. I just want to show you the diversity of population in 19th century, of course, before uh, people uh, have been nationalized. So, roughly, I will mention, because it's uh, maybe difficult to read it, but how much diversified the population is, in fact, but was also, you know. So we could have, of course, different Bedouin tribes. We have sedentary, sedan, uh, Hadar people. We had craftsmen. We had uh, pastoral nomads. We had uh, merchant, small traders, large traders. We had... Uh, a different kind of uh, even social group, which were not specially pastoral nomads. Uh, we had also, we can say, Sunni, Shia, Ibadi. We had, among the Sunni, we had uh, different madhab, which bring also some uh, maybe different cultural orientation. Uh, so just to say that uh, anyway, this uh, area was quite diversified. So, of course, um, now it's completely different since the people have been nationalized. So, I'm speaking about paradox of the heritage notion because it, it has a temporal dimension. For its heritage role is related to the past and goes toward the future. But its direction is not always linear, as for all human history, of course. The transfer from the past toward the present and to the future could be difficult, depending on the people's memory, people's history, especially when it concerns collective memory or oral history and even written history. I don't mean that it's only a matter of consensus, like people should agree on one aspect only. But I am referring to the collective identity through which part of the singular identity is expressed and passed on from group or lineage, but also collective values and reference to others reference to local area, to the national entity, and to the world. Then there is a double contact between perception and realities that occur when one considers the heritage notion. This is probably at this point that one should consider the question of consensus or what is we can say imagined. The consensus of each one leads to similar acknowledgement, similar values ascribed to a building, for example, to landscapes or place name, vocabulary, clauses, codification, and through which there is identification. Concerning museum object that we consider having an heritage function, they have at least two characteristics. These objects become identified with ourselves. They are exhibited in museum because they make sense. In other words, I can say they partake of the express museum's content. The object materialize our awareness of the past, of the time. They help to release ourselves from the excessive ascendancy of our immediacy. 
In the 70s, the government of every Gulf country started to consider the heritage question, the Turath. First, the goal was to make known to the world the historical roots of this nation. This is why prehistorians and archaeologists were invited to do researches in these countries. But the most spectacular, and I think what bring a real acknowledgement, even a status and a total awareness of the heritage intention, was the event called popular tradition, Aturath Ashabi, of the sea and of the desert. This event coexists today, but with another vision of the heritage, more contemporary, aesthetical, and more related to arts. This is, I can, as I can summarize uh, the situation. One should know that this popular heritage is shown in national museum. Thus, this popular heritage is now so much idealized, beautified, that the object and the events have lost significance. The goal is mostly to support and to identify with national project. The support is made after a presumed harmony of the traditional society especially the moral values of the past, like solidarity, generosity, but the social conditions of the past are forgotten. The National Museum were created at the same period of time that the popular manifestations. Except the National Museum of Qatar, created by British museographists and opened in 1975, and with a modern presentation, the other ones are conserved in a very traditional way. I mean, they were not made by professionals, but one can think that the thematic choices, the social categories, which were presented, have been selected with the agreement of the concerned authorities. In the National Museum, the identity categories which are presented to the public are the most traditional. They bring a quite old-fashioned, outdated image of the global society. I don't know if the GCC gives also some direction for the heritage practices and transmission. But the media mentioned cultural concern of government about transmission, education, loss of identity, globalization. And this is why we have the feeling that we have seen the same things when we visit the different national museums of the Gulf countries. Now, as an example, I'm coming back to the identity category, which I, I note when I was visiting some, let's say, all the national museum in the Gulf. I will take as example some words, I mean the word, most of the words which are used. The word in use in the national museum are, for example, for the national themselves, like waiting, binding, cutting, etc. The extension of the word could be large, for it can designate a kind of building or a concrete object which is identical and has the same use in, in another Gulf country. In this way, the building or the object will be described as Qatari or Omani. If there is no special, uh, even if there is no special sign referring to that country, but anthropologists and museographists need more information to localize such objects, like design, shape, 
or the use by special category of people, any sign or knowledge allowing to put it in a place, like many silver jewelries, for example, influenced by Omani craftsmen, or giving information about trade, exchanges, cultural influences, like wooden door, for example, coming mostly from East Africa, or element of architecture influenced by India. All these are part of the heritage identity. Other word, Bedouin. So the Bedouin word has double meaning and connotation in this museum. Without asserting it directly, the word refers to the origin of the Arabian Peninsula population. In Qatar University, as far as I know, a few years ago, I don't know if it's still like this now, I know that Bedouin peoples are said to be the first inhabitant of the area. In museums, some ambiguity appears concerning this Bedouin designation. The word expresses a way of life based on breeding animal and family movement with their flock. They are so-called nomads. For me, I would say pastoral nomads. Also, this way of life of pastoral nomads is associated with moral values, such as solidarity, generosity, etc. In reality, all skill and quality which are transmitted through tribal organization and genealogical descent. In fact, the process of pastoral, the process of pastoral nomadism is not explained or shown. Even through, even though this is a highly developed way of breeding animals. Contrary to what is generally believed, this is not a primitive way of life. It is a mankind's relation to a special arid environment. Also, what is not said in these museums is the process of sedentarization that came in the 60s and actual role as identity value. Bedouin is not anymore a way of life, but a sign of genuineness of the Arab culture. This means that someone is Bedouin to genealogical affiliation, then from a good lineage, but could be modern anyway. In contrast with Bedouin, one can see the word sedentary, hover. Among it, we can have city dwellers, villagers, eventually mountain dwellers, mountain peoples like uh, Jebali in Oman, they are not, all these words are neutral, allowing language variation and offering some diversity of presentation, but just by word. This word category are combined with very general information about craft and activi uh, economical activity, but very general. So other words, the tribes, Al-Qabail. They are mentioned as a wall but not as a member of such a tribe, particular tribe. The tribes as a subject give brief information as a social organization of the past. Only the royal Kabila, let's say tribe, could be mentioned uh, in reference to a historical background. Other more natural words even, this is group, al-jama'a, or people, al-sha'ab. These were, uh, of course, neutral in the sense that there is no reference to internal hierarchy, for example, or social rank, according to social system of the past, or even special category based on genealogical descent and the quality of kinship, like asyl or rare asyl. In this, uh, indeed, this is an anthropological concept, 
But I give them as example in order to show you the kind of choices that could be made by museologists. Choices are made on different selection, depending on the public, of course. We, we like to, uh, to be concerned. Here, for example, since we are in Arab countries, we could refer to this concept of uh, asyl and rare asyl, uh, because people are supposed to know. But in European museum, it will require more explanation, so we may forgot about it. <coughs> so you see the meaning with uh, people concerned. The actual presentation is based on social equality, as is the criterion of citizenship. And this is the citizenship on which is based the identity in the Gulf countries, in contrast to the foreigners. Some more neutral words, like men, women, boy, girls, are just simple indications associated with clauses. But no reference to personal status, as it could be. For example, I know some jewelries that ladies are or were wearing after giving birth to their first child or to their first boy, or special one for elderly woman, or belt for young boy after circumcision, etc. Oman had the uh, uh, diversity of such uh, jewels. Even in Qatar, the Bedouin father used to give a hanja, a knife, to his son at the age of eight. This is to say that even simple category, like men, women, could be rich of knowledge. I noticed that in the National Museum, there is no indication about religion, which is also part of the human history. If books are exhibited, no information is given concerning the selection offered to the public. Sometimes science or religious book are presented together, but on what criterion? We know that books could be interesting for their ancientness, for their calligraphy, and of course, of their content. One of the main critics I could make on this National Museum's presentation is the lack of very limited information. Caption and label give such data like man's robe, thobe, woman's clock. That's it. In Oman, I remember I saw some years ago a museum with regional costumes expressing the diversity of the states. Actually, it is closed for renovation. In fact, this is the object itself and its use, which bring to mind the identity feature and the type of society, society at the origin of the nation. As such, we have the role of the man and the woman. So this is the kind of presentation it's given in many mu national museums. For example, the man the man, is, the man is always shown in outside activities and as a professional. He hosts male guests, take care of camels, dive for pearls or fish or sell, sell imitation market product, or is a craftsman in the souk. So for this, we can, see, we can see him as a model in front of the smithy or holding the traditional carpenter uh, carpenter's drill. The souk is designed with a several shop in line, and the man could be with his son as an apprentice. For the woman, the, wom the woman is always related to the private and familial domain. She is dressed with the traditional abaya, the one covering all the body from head to feet. The face is covered with a mask, el batula or veil, burga. This is a way to emphasize the good behavior of 
sexual modesty. She's shown sitting near a cradle, then in a role of mother. She's, always, she's also presented with supposed feminine occupation inside the house, cooking, sewing, weaving, eventually the care of goats. A daughter could be nearby, young teenager, then learning after her mother and like her, dress with the traditional attires, expressing modesty. The head veil called, she wear the, the head veil called Albernek. As you can understand, there is a message behind these last two presentations, but it is not written. Usually there is no information. There, there is a suggested message, the role of each one in the traditional society, even if I can notice many mistakes after anthropological researches. So this was some example. In general, the presentation is without almost no explanation, as I said. The scenography fits the image in which the citizens are supposed to recall or to learn for the youngest the ground of the society's code and rules. Also, the national events are another opportunity to reassert these codes. For this occasion, for example, Kuwaiti citizens for ex uh, are asked to wear the traditional dress. And the school teacher in Qatar are presenting themes of the traditional life as it pleased them. What is interesting is that in ethnographical exhibition rooms of the National uh, Museum in Bahrain, for example, which, was, which is a contemporary design architecture created 20 years ago, about, the thematic choices and the display are traditional. Similar to what I commented before. And the, the Danish ethnographist who participated to the creation of the museum and to whom I asked, confirmed to me that it was the will of the Ministry of Information to display such traditional themes. In Kuwait, the National Museum created after 91, 1991 is similar in its themes and subject. In Sharjah, the Emirate claims that it is the most cultural oriented of the Gulf actually has 12 museums, but no national museum is made yet because there is no agreement on the themes and subject. Actually, what is expressing the national heritage, the Turath, is a set of restored buildings, and some of them are presented as cultural village, surrounded by folklore presentation of false craftsmen and supposed ladies' work. These kind of cultural village are on fashion in the Gulf countries. In Qatar, a similar one existed some recent years ago, but it seems that visitors were no more interested because nothing was going on. A new one, very modern and luxurious, has been built recently after the ship of a touristic agora and amphitheater. Podium for show, restaurant, shisha cafe, private beach. In fact, this is a place for enjoying the cultural events. Unity diversity question, it's a big question. The main question is the gap between cultural unity in the, of the Gulf population, Al Khaliji, that can be taken to mean different things depending on the context. The context could be the foreign population, but also the wish to express diversity. Diversity is the assertion of oneself, the exclusiveness of one's own culture. 
or distinct cultural feeder. As I show you at the beginning, diversity was expressed by local population until state creation. After the creation of nations, the cultural diversity is now expressed in prehistory, in antiquity, archaeology, therefore in a very distant history. Maybe because there is a lack of museographical experience and ethnographical recording, there is no real distinction between archaeological and ethnographical heritage. The common point in the National Museum of the Gulf is the very traditional image they offered. They don't reflect the actual society with all the deep changes that occurred. My point is not to critique this view, but merely stating a fact. Considering the fact, I notice, for example, that a lot of changes concern women in their kind of activities, how they dress, the, change, the changes in marriage family choices, and the family size, habitation, and so on. So to conclude, uh, okay. to conclude, I would say that the diversity of the actual way of life, public and private, offers a strong gap of image between the societies that display modernity and the very old-fashioned national museum. The question is what discourse are involved. We know that identity construction is a very elaborate, multifaceted process. So finally, I will add two elements for thinking. If we, the first one, if we try to take into consideration these two alternative poles, such as tradition and modernity, as a division or a passage from one to the other, we cannot explain them as a calendar time relation. The reason for that is that time passage could be explained in a multitude, multiple ways, such as cycle, as a decadence, as a fall, instability, also as a coming back, or as a continuing process. All these expressed ways are called temporality. This notion of temporality allows to explain the time passage depending on the event's intensity and rhythm. It is different than time's notion, which concerns the datation's linearity. So this idea and the citation came from Mr. Bruno Latour. Nous n'avons nous jamais été modernes. We never been modern. Very interesting. A second point. The construction of social identity is a very elaborate and multifaceted process. It is not a natural given. It is built after different discourses and choices which are made. Thank you very much. Okay, so at this point, this is your chance to pile in with uh, comments and questions. Um, I say comments and questions, but, but please keep them very brief, sharp, point to the point, so we have plenty of room for diverse input. <laughs> Sorry, there was someone at the back there. Right, let's, let's okay, that, that, that's, that's 
sorry, I, I give it to you right away. Thank you for the lecture. Um, I'm Luis, I work for the Qatar Olympic and Sports Museum. And I just want to ask you how can the authorities or the people involved in the building of the museums escape from the temptation of modern building iconic architecture museums versus the content and based on the collection that you're trying to explain to us. Thank you. I think the, we can say the shells is, can be modern, no problem. But the, the content, I think we have, I mean, people should try to think about it. And uh, you know, all this Gulf country anyway, of course there is uh, tradition, but also the tradition came with uh, opening to the world already. From very long time it was open to the world. And uh, it's a pity, in a way, to, to give this image like uh, something static. And uh, it's like uh, nothing changed. But uh, we know it should be maybe uh, to show kind of dynamic of, uh, of the element, of the social aspect. It's very important, I think. But uh, this, of course, uh, people should think about it and try to maybe to open more a little. Also, I noticed that, uh, for example, I know, of course, Qatar is my first field work very well. Uh, maybe people are not reading uh, enough uh, because, or listening to others, because, in fact, there is few elements which are specific to Qatar, for example. It's part of the identity. Uh, so, uh, because, as I, I notice, um, Maybe it's a decision of the GCC, but all the Gulf countries uh, are presenting their, uh, let's say, cultural, uh, nation, the national cultural aspect is shown through um, pearls industry. But for Qatar, for me, it's completely wrong because mostly people were pastoral nomads. And of course, they were also diving but so, for example, why not to keep this specificity? And uh, you know, so because Qatar and uh, each country of the Gulf is always demanding to, um, okay, to show the Khaliji culture, but also to have their own specificity. So, but when I see the museum, really, I don't see the diversity and the specificity of each one. Yes, um, I had three related questions. So from your point of view, are there any museums here in the Gulf that you think have done a good job at presenting at least one aspect of, of the local culture? And do you know of any museums anywhere else in the world which you think have captured sort of national identity, even though it's obviously dynamic and changing? And third, if you could set up one exhibit at the National Museum in Qatar, what would it be? <laughs> so first, the, the first museum in Qatar, really, National Museum, uh, I like it, really. It was a good museum. But it was quite open, you know? Uh, it was a diversity of subject. And even, uh, yeah, we could uh, understand. You know, also, the problem is the lack of information, as I said. So, but uh, even if there is similar image from one country to another one, with information, we can make some difference also. So this, second, in the Arab world, um, in Maghreb, I saw some interesting museum. Yeah, uh, I think in Tunisia, Algeria, they have uh, interesting museum. But of course, uh, they are already a little old, but uh, why not? I mean, it's just a question of renovation sometimes. But of course, they have a lot of objects. There, there is a problem with the object here. But anyway, it's possible. As I suggest also, we can make copy. If you say it's a copy from the traditional one, so it's no problem. Just we have to be honest with the public. And to do an exhibition, Oh, plenty. I have plenty of subjects in my head. So, <laughs> so uh, for example, if I would do about uh, 
uh, trade of pearls, as we, <laughs> so I will give specific things about Qatar. Hi, Dr. Mantini, how are you? I'm wondering how you um, would go about studying something that is not documented and something that's not collected, because this is one of the major problems, here in Qatar anyways, on building this national museum. So there's a point of um, doubt when we're looking at oral histories. We have an ongoing dialogue of how do we know what perception is and what reality is, and how do they resolve that in this museum? But I know also it was a lot of recording. Of course, not to mention my work I have, but it's in French language, but should be translated. And the Folklore Museum also, they did a lot of work, should be some documentation, but people have to, to go, I mean, to dig a little and to look you know, around, but I'm sure there is enough for doing a museum. I'm sure. <laughs> perhaps while people are thinking, thinking, perhaps while people are thinking, I might um, risk a couple of comments myself. I, I was wondering what you thought about, or if you've seen the uh, small um, exhibition, Mushereb and Enrichment Center on the Corniche. Mm -hmm. I find that here in Qatar quite an interesting contrasting of the the old with the new and the future. So that that's that that I wonder whether whether you have any comment about that. The other thing that strikes me is is um, the the whole project in, in Abu Dhabi, the national project, the Sheikh Zayed National mm -hmm. Museum project. Um, the there there seems to be to be at least an effort, I'm not sure how far it's gone or will be going, of of bringing oral the history of simply having exhibits where you, you will walk around and simply hear people talk. Um, although there, of course, there too, there's been, I think one of the problems with the Abu Dhabi project has been precisely that people could not agree about whether this was going to be a typical national museum by bringing in, talking about the, the globe, the interaction with the world, or whether it was just going to be Abu Dhabi, or UAE, or Sheikh Zayed. So I think some of the same issues are still being worked out all around this. In fact, unfortunately, I didn't have time to see Musheri project and I'm leaving tomorrow. Uh, for Abu Dhabi, I don't know much about the Abu Dhabi new museum, but uh, sometimes also, you know, as I said, identity question is a multifaceted, you know, uh, question. So when it's politics also too much involved in the, you know, identity, it's more complicated, I think. So, you know, identity could be through the language, through, I don't know, genealogy, through many aspects, occupation and so on. So, um, anyway, people have to talk between themselves and uh, think about it. But uh, I just heard about Abu Dhabi. I think, anyway, it's, uh, of course, there's challenge and discussion, but it's interesting, yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. I have a couple of questions. Uh, it seems to me that with respect to your discussion of the gaps of the image, uh, from whose perspective uh, is it defined as a gap or an opportunity? Uh, because we know in the study of utterance and silence, there is so much also in the silence and the invisibility. Uh, so how do you respond to that? Do you think that the Gulf societies, nationals themselves view that as a gap? Uh, the other thing is about, um, you touched on very interesting and fascinating elements, which I appreciated very much. But I want to go back to your notion of the private sphere of women, of domesticity, and so on. Uh, I think just looking at some historical ethnographies of the Gulf, um, it's not easy to dwell so much on the interiority 
concept because as we have seen when men, for example, when diving, the whole beach is populated by women, inshallah, Arab and so on. So uh, how do you respond to the shifting boundaries of that private sphere? Finally, what, just to build on Jackie's uh, po last point, what would a museum you wish to see would include? <laughs> Yeah, the gap of image is because I know Qatar since long time, you know, yeah, about 30 years. And uh, I saw the evolution of the country and uh, I found it pity not to, uh, to present something more dynamic to show how fast it was. So because, of course, we are not, it's not an academic, you know, presentation. But even in museum, we have object, we have image, and the image, when you have only one image, only about very traditional aspect, we think, oh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I visited several times with, uh, you know, Qataris ladies or from other countries of the Gulf. Um, they go one time or two times maximum, and they don't come back, because for them, they feel like it's boring. I'm sorry to say that. At the very beginning, I remember in the National Museum of Qatar, uh, uh, it was so open, you know, recently, two, three years, for example. I used to follow some people and listening what they were saying, especially in the pearl diving section. It was very interesting because I could see the grandfather and, the, you know, his grandson very often, and the grandfather used to comment. But uh, it was quite dynamic way of presenting the thing, you know, at, uh, in the pearl diving section. And uh, of course we could feel, I mean, it was more open also, you know. But uh, this kind of image, normally, I was thinking about this. No, we, the photographers, they used to say, one, normally an image is speaking for itself, in itself. No need of explanation. So it's why when I see, for example, the presentation of the man outside and the woman inside, so I understand immediately the meaning, you know? And the people, they understand immediately also. But we know, of course, that it was much more open. So it's why maybe at least should be maybe some few stages, you know, like something more dynamic in the presentation, just in order to see, to show that, uh, you know, the, the society is not blocked or static. Something like this. I was wondering if there's a if there was a cultural resistance to this kind of national identity construction, where the people who were uh, kind of misrepresented, how accept acceptant were they to this kind of process, the kind of what you called the nationalization of people. So, yeah, uh, you also mentioned the kind of uh, the Bedouin purity. Uh, I saw that more of a class gap, uh, where the people who were not considered kind of Bedouin pure, were they kind of trying to reassert their status in society after this uh, construction? That's... Yeah, it's why, of course, the sensitive aspect, because uh, uh, let's say as an anthropologist, I understand that in fact, the authority and the power came uh, from the kinship. So that means the, the people who have the power here that means they have a long genealogy, uh, so-called good descent, and so on. It's ideology, anyway. We know that. And of course, to present this aspect will be too delicate. And why not? Why to to speak about it? And uh, and that means to show the hierarchy. Better to speak. Maybe if we have to speak. And anyway, it was not a real hierarchy. We know in the Gulf, it's more like a rank you know, diversity. 
so if we have to speak about this kind of aspect, we just we can just mention that uh, okay, so what is appreciated, you know, by uh, by um, people is of course uh, genealogy and so on, and they are able to um, uh, to reconstruct their genealogy very far, something like this. Uh, or we can speak about occupation, uh, but of course, you know. But anyway, we give more information, and of course, we have to select because why to embarrass some peoples? We are not for this. Even in in Europe, we don't uh, we don't do like this. Of course, we we try to respect as the people, but anyway, we we want to learn. You know. Uh, so if people want to know more, of course, they have to read other things. In that case, for, uh, so there is publication, and they could know more about it. Hello, sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Colin Jones. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matini, for what I think has been a very brave, if I may say so, um, talk. You have touched on something which I think um, most people anywhere would feel might be a little cheeky, you know, talking about national identity uh, to, other, to, to, to other nations. Um, I'm with Michelle Properties. I'm involved with the development of four historic heritage houses in downtown Doha. And I'm a South African, which makes me an African, which makes me not a Westerner <laughs> and not a person from the Gulf. Um, I've only been here for just over six months, and which doesn't compare uh, to your 30 years in any measure, and I should therefore be shutting up and sitting down. But as a South African and African, and having been here a short time and in being involved in trying to tell a story, help be being invited to be part of telling a story by Qataris about their heritage, I find myself in a in a kind of odd position, actually. Because your example, for instance, of the image of men outside doing stuff and women inside sort of doing nothing, in inverted commas, uh, when I think of that now, I ask myself, how do I see that? And I realize that, that the way I see it may not be the way it is. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that a lot of what I'm attempting to understand and interpret there comes loaded with a lot of, with a lot of stuff yeah. about w what is freedom, what is equality, uh, gender questions, all of that, which I think are important questions to ask, but it's also important answers and it's about the silences sometimes, in which that isn't taken, isn't expressed and isn't answered because it's taken for, for granted that the people in those situations understand it differently to the way I understand it. Mm -hmm. sure. So when we talk about what may seem and look like from our perspective to be non, not moving, not not uh, uh, being true to the time now, I think that we need to ask ourselves, as those who are not of this culture, but are, um, in a sense, always the guest here, um, how do we, when we are involved in the creation of telling this story, how do we tell that story in a way which isn't imposing our expectations, our perceptions, our stuff on that, and let the integrity of that story come through. And, and the, sorry to be speaking so long. The other thing about identity, I think, is it's, it's a vexed question because identity is constantly in the making, yeah. <laughs> as we know. Uh, how do you keep pace with telling that story when people themselves are not and particularly in a country like Qatar, which is a young country, relatively speaking, uh, where identity formation is very much in the process. How do, you, how do you tell that story 
truthfully and with integrity for where it is at this moment, without again expecting too much out of it. But you know, when I, I say every, this kind of things about uh, identity, which is, as I say, not a real critic, but except yeah, for the partition between men and women, it's more because uh, I, I'm, I don't give an answer especially. It's just I'm trying to push the people to think and to reply and to, to give uh, maybe their point of view. So, and anyway, this museum now, you know, the Gulf is open to everybody, to the, even to the tourist, tourists. So I guess they have, uh, you know, um, an aim to let everybody understand what was the society in the past and what is it now. And this is a choice they made also of trying to make a national museum. So, and even when I was involved in the um, uh, content of the, for the new National Museum, very often, so I bring some idea uh, with other colleagues. I was not alone, of course. Um, but I, I didn't have so much reply on the other side. So in a way, when I speak like this, and I know it's kind of a, a little provocation, I, I wish I could have some reply one day. <laughs> well, I, I imagine the, the, the rest of the reply will probably have to wait a little while longer. And in fact, it might just be until people have gathered again outside for a little reception. Uh, we, we, we can continue some of these discussions in a more intimate setting. So, but on this note, I would like to uh, say congratulations and many thanks to uh, Dr. Montigny. Thank you.